Welcome, everybody. Normally, I'd have you scoot out because I'm really short and I can't see over the computers. But I'll just trust you're going to participate awesomely, right? Yes. OK. Um, so I am a professor in the School of Education at UVU. Um, and I kind of got my start actually teaching. I taught down in Mexico in a little tiny town called Salitzintla. Um, taught junior high. And then I came back here and I taught dance for a while. And then I went to grad school uh, and I studied instructional psychology and technology. So basically where technology and everything that's going on in our heads and our minds come together and how they're impacting each other is what I've really focused on for a long time. Within the last five or six years, kind of based on that, I started studying the teen brain a lot. So in other words, I st spend all day, every day, studying teenage brains. Excellent. And a little, it's a little creepy, right? It's a little creepy. OK. All right. So um, Ms. Johnson invited me here today to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in your heads maybe to try and help explain some of the things that you deal with as adolescents. Um, I want to start by t saying that I have the utmost respect for you. I basically would get down and bow down to you for what you deal with on a daily basis and handle so beautifully. Because um, I know it can be a pain in the butt to be a teenager, especially from a brain perspective when I study what's going on up there. So uh, we just wanted to share a little bit about what's going on with that and then also start to talk about how technology might be kind of interfacing with that a little bit. So as we begin to discuss these things, let me preface that I am a technologist. I use tech all the time. I love technology. It's been a passion of mine for decades. Um, so I'm not coming to you from a place of, you stupid teenagers shouldn't be using technology. Not at all, OK? Uh, I'm right there with you. I think it's awesome. So we're going to be talking a lot about kind of what's going on and what we need to be thinking about, OK? So as we get started, um, we need a bit of a preface in order to really be able to talk intelligently about what's going on in your mind with regard to technology and other things. Um, we've got to understand how the brain actually works, especially as it's learning things. Okay, so we're going to start by talking about neurons. How many of you have heard of neurons before? Who's taken anatomy? Good, a few of you. All right, so luckily you carry a mnemonic device around with you all the time for neurons. I mentioned that I was a dance teacher, yes? Okay, everybody, jazz hands to the right. Go. If we all do it, we don't look stupid. Come on, you can do it. Okay. All right, this is a really great mnemonic device for a neuron. So everybody hold it up for me, and we're going to go through what this is. Now, a neuron is just a nerve cell. We have billions of them all over our bodies. That's what allows us to feel things and like know what we're feeling. Okay, But we have billions of them in our heads, too. These are the primary cells in our brains. So wiggle your fingers for me. At the ends of your brain cells are, anybody know? What are these called? Dendrites. You can cheat. You're welcome to. It's up there. <laughs> All right, so we've got dendrites at the end. And the dendrites are responsible for receiving information. OK? So information travels around in your brain in the form of electricity. You've basically got electricity zapping around in your brain all the time. OK? So that electrical pulse comes in through your dendrites, travels through what we call the cell body, where the nucleus and stuff is, and then down into something called the axon. And the axon is basically just a wire, OK? Helps to send that electrical signal around. Now, if you look at all the wires that are in this classroom, there are a ton of them. Are they bare wire? No. What's over the wires? Rubber, plastic, right? There's stuff wrapping those wires. And why is it there? OK, so it's protecting them from damage, first of all. What other purpose does that covering over the wires serve? Pre preventing electrical fires, right? Because if that casing weren't there, then the electricity could jump out, right? So we've got the same type of thing going on on our brain cells to protect that axon and to keep the information in the axon so it's not jumping out all over our brains. That would be messy, 
Okay? It also make it so we don't think very clearly. We've got this stuff called myelin. So myelin is actually fat. You have a fat brain. Yes. You're supposed to. Okay? We're going to come back to that and talk about that a little bit. But basically, you've got this fatty covering that covers up that axon so that it's protected and so that th your thoughts, which is that electricity, that's basically what's happening. Your thoughts are electricity in your brain. They're not leaking out everywhere. Okay? Now, in order to finish up this metaphor, I want you to grab your upper arm. Grab it. Okay, and just rip your arm off for me, if you would. Okay. All right. So if we imagine spurting gore, right, that would basically be like the ends of our neurons. So we've got these little axon terminals that come out, branches, and then they send that signal out to other brain cells. Does electricity travel really well and efficiently and go where we want it to across wet, squishy places? Not so much, right? It kind of goes <laughs> everywhere if we send it over a wet, squishy place. And your brain is a wet, squishy place. So when it gets to the ends of those axons, it turns into a chemical instead of electricity. It turns into a chemical, and it gets paired up with another chemical that's naturally occurring in your brain. They're called neurotransmitters. And there are a bunch of them that help us think about things. But they do other things as well. When we go running and we kind of get that runner's high, that's a neurotransmitter called endorphins that gets us kind of pumped up. Yes, I'm awesome, right? Dopamine helps us think really well. But there are other ones like cortisol that can kind of stress us out. So we've got all these different neurotransmitters up in there depending on the type of information we're thinking about that'll carry that signal across this little gap that we have in our brain. So in between each brain cell is a little gap called the synapse or synaptic cleft, OK? So that's the basics. Now, how do the cells actually communicate with each other? What I'd like you to do, put up your brain cell again for me and reach it out towards somebody else in the classroom, anybody else. And you don't want to touch them because there's always a gap in between your neurons, right? No touching. <laughs> All right. Now with your other arm, keep this one out. With your other arm, reach toward anybody else in the classroom. Okay, keep them up and look around the room. And you start to get a picture for what's going on in your brain. Okay? So as we learn new information, you can put your hands down. Anytime you hear something new or have a new experience in life, basically what you're doing is physically changing your brain. Your cells are actually reaching out growing those dendrites, growing those axons, and trying to communicate to each other, OK? That's probably the first thing I learned about the brain that really extraordinarily impacted me, guys. And I wish that I'd known it when I was a teenager, which is a lot of the reason why Ms. Johnson is having me come to talk to you today, is because I wish I'd known some of this stuff when I was your age, because it would have helped me better understand myself and some of the things that I went through and why I had trouble dealing with things sometimes because I just didn't know how it worked up there, okay? When we have new experiences, when anything happens to us, when we hear new information, we are physically changing our brains. And that's a pretty huge deal. I mean, I kind of realized that the decisions I made in my life would kind of impact other things that happened to me. But I really did not understand that the decisions I made in my life physically changed my brain, which from that point made it so that every thought I had and every decision I make was kind of based on what I'd done up here, those changes that I'd made. So I actually want to show that to you. Let's show the video.
that yes, we change our brains when we make decisions, but we can also alter them in positive ways if we've had kind of bad things or bad decisions in our past, okay? So our brains are super flexible. They can change and they're going through this all the time. Now, if we move down, that means that as you go through every day, making decisions, learning things, experiencing things, this is what you're doing. You're creating these pathways and these connections in your mind. And basically what happens is the first time you hear a piece of information, those neurons kind of reach out and are like, dude, are we supposed to talk to each other? And then if you never hear that information again or never have that experience again, they're like, no, nah, never mind. But if you hear it again, they're like, wait, maybe. And the more you hear it and the more you hear it or the more you do it, the stronger those connections get. Okay? So that is super important for us to understand too, that the more we do something, okay, the more we even say something to ourselves, the stronger those connections become in our minds. That's long-term memory, basically, is that these neurons have learned, you know what, yeah, we are supposed to talk to each other, we're supposed to communicate, and we're gonna keep this relationship and this connection strong. All right. What that means, and this is another thing that I really, really wish I'd known <laughs> years ago. I'm not going to tell you how old I am. Okay. That means that every single brain is unique. Every single one. Because nobody in the world that has ever lived has had the exact same experience as you, has heard the same bits of information as you, Nobody has existed that's done that. Even your siblings, even if you have an identical twin. The neurons, the connections, the pathways you've made in your head are different from everyone else's. So that was pretty huge for me to understand too because I used to look at people and I would have an experience and that experience was not that big a deal to me, right? So something kind of bad happened and I'd be like, well, that sucks, but it's not a huge deal. And the exact same thing would happen to my friend, and they would break down. It would be completely overwhelming. And I'd look at them like, what's wrong with you? It's not that big a deal, right? Man, you must be weak, and I must be really strong. That's how it is. And it has nothing to do with strength or weakness. And it has everything to do with their prior experiences and their knowledge and the pathways they've kind of constructed. So when that experience happens to me, my connections are saying, okay, we can deal with this. But their connections may be like, whoa, no, uh-uh, I've had enough. Okay, and it has nothing to do, again, with strength of character and everything to do with these connections and these experiences that they've had in the past. That was huge for me to learn. I wish I had known that. So I wasn't walking around kind of judging uh, the people that were around me and I could have been a little bit more empathetic. Okay. All right, so I was reading one of my favorite books of all time. Ask your parents if you can read it. No, it's super awesome. Um, <laughs> fantasy fiction, if you're interested in fantasy fiction. Um, and I just love this quote so much because I think it explains what we're talking about today really beautifully. It's like everyone tells a story about themselves inside their own head, always, all the time. That story makes you what you are. And we build ourselves out of that story. And this is literally happening, right? As we make these changes and connections inside of our heads, it becomes a story that we tell ourselves about who we are, what we're capable of, what we're not capable of, what's going to hurt us, what's not. And then we start to make decisions and actually live our lives based on this story that we've started to tell ourselves. Okay? All right. Here's where it gets interesting, especially in high school, right? Is there or is there not a little bit of pressure in high school to conform? Yeah, to be like the people around you. There's a little bit of pressure to do that, right? The problem is, as we move down to the next one, we've also got other people telling us how we should be, right? So here we are kind of trying to fit in, but then we've got all these different people telling us what we should be like, right? Who's telling us what we should be like? Parents, 
teachers, friends, right? All these people trying to tell us who we should be. And yet I just told you that you're unique, that this is different up here than anybody else. And I love this next quote that I found. It, again, just expresses the truth so well. When we look at your brain, when we look at these connections and how everything functions, it's really hard to be somebody you're not. It's not just about behaviors. It's literally about how your mind works. So if your mind works a little bit differently from everybody else's, you can't be like everyone else. That's not how it works. We're all supposed to be a little bit different. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to improve ourselves, or if people have good advice for us, that we shouldn't try to follow it. But what I'm saying is that we shouldn't try to change ourselves to be like others just to be like others, right? That that is actually really hard for us to do from a brain perspective. And it is much easier and much healthier for us to allow ourselves to be who we are. You've got enough to deal with, <laughs> quite frankly, right? All right, what we're going to go into now, we've got a basic idea of how the brain actually works and that your brain is unique, and that is true. But as we look at the brain overall, there are some patterns that we notice as far as which parts of the brain are kind of in charge when we do different activities. And that's going to be important for us to understand, too, as we start talking about what's different about your brains, teenage brains, than from little kids' brains and from old people brains. Okay, what's different about yours? And that's what I love to study all day. Okay, so we're actually going to talk about what some of these different parts of the brain do. So, people who've had anatomy, here's your quiz. Okay, get your hands up, everybody. We got to move, it's cold in here. All right. Let's go ahead and give yourself a nice neck rub all the way on the back. Don't push too hard on any of these. <laughs> All right, so we have found these little blobs back here. Does anybody know what those are called? Excellent. These are called the cerebella. Okay, that word means little brain. And basically, yeah, these are their own little autonomous brains back there that help us do automatic motor movement, basically, is what they're in charge of. So it makes it so I can walk down the hall and talk to people at the same time. If I had to think about walking, can you imagine what the halls would be like? If we all had to think about walking, we'd all be just be like, right? I mean, we'd look like toddlers. It would be very entertaining. That's why they look that way when they're walking. Because for them, it's like taking all of their brain power <laughs> to figure out how to make this happen. But gradually, the cerebella take that over, and they say, hey, we got this, right? Okay, now I'm going to oversimplify as we go through the brain. I'm going to talk about, okay, this part of the brain does that or is in charge of that. What we do know is that the entire brain does everything, right? It really all works together. So if you've heard any myths like we only use 10% of our brain or you're right-brained or you're left-brained, that's all bunk. It's not true, okay? We use all of our brains all of the time. But when we look at certain tasks, we can see that one part is the most active during a task. And so we say that part's kind of in charge of that responsibility. All right, so let's get our hands back up and come to the back of your skull, all the way at the back. Does anybody know what lobes we found here? Occipital lobes, excellent. So these guys are in charge of visual processing, basically, right? Really good design, eyes up here. Visual processing all the way back here. So if you hit it really hard, you can see Mickey Mouse all the time. Just right there. It's kind of cool. Okay. Sorry, I get a little excited about brain malfunctioning. That's weird. Okay. All right, so we've got occipital lobes that process vision. Let's come up on the sides here. And where are your heels, the heels of your hands right now? They're on your temples. So these are your temporal lobes. Okay. Now, these are kind of in charge of processing stuff that we hear. And on the left lobes in particular, we've got our language processing centers. So there's something called Wernicke's area that actually processes language. And it's actually true for ASL, for visual languages, as well as for spoken languages. Okay, So it uses the same area. Obviously, some visual input for ASL as well. Okay. 
There's some really great stuff hidden back behind these temporal lobes. They're a nice kind of protective barrier for stuff that's inside that's really important. We've got two little guys called the hippocampi. They look like this on either side of your brain. And they're your memory processors. Okay, So they're the ones that tell you what you should and shouldn't remember. They're your working memory that helps you kind of focus on things and remember what you're working on. So if you're doing a math problem, you've got to use the formula. OK, what are all the numbers that we're using as part of that? How do I actually go through this? OK, the hippocampi are doing that. And at the end of those are some little guys called the amygdalae. And they're emotional centers of your brain. OK, so they're all kind of hidden down inside. All right, now let's put our hands all the way up top and just kind of kick back and chill for a minute. All right, these are my favorites. I have favorite lobes, which makes me an absolute nerd, and I'm okay with that. Okay? All right, so these are called your parietal lobes. The least interesting thing they do, this fold right here, every fold in your brain does different stuff. It's kind of cool. That feels things on your body. Okay? So there's actually like a little, like a little dude on that fold, and if you poke it right here, then you feel it on your left hand and stuff. It's really cool. Okay? So we feel things on our body. That's not all that exciting in the grand scheme of things. The rest of those lobes integrate different experiences and ideas and stuff together. And when we ask teenagers, who are you? What role do you play in the world? What difference do you want to make? How do you fit into to the circumstances around you? When we ask you about you, this is what gets really excited. So we call these the seat of the self. And really, adolescence, your teenage years, are all about finding your identity, figuring out who you're going to be. So that's why I love these so much, is because that's what they're all about, is your search for who you are. Okay. Now, get both hands up. We need them both for the last ones. All right, right up here. Where are we? Frontal lobes. All right, so we need both hands because they're really big. They're the biggest lobes in our brains, bigger in humans than in any other species. So what do they do? That fold right there makes us do things. Okay, so we have our automatic motor movement back here, stuff we don't want to have to think about. But up here, we've got purposeful motor movement. So if I'm going to reach out, or if I'm going to walk over there, I'm going to use my cerebellum to help me, but that's also kind of directing my action. Now again, the rest of the lobes are where it gets exciting. Okay. Frontal lobes are responsible for things like planning, consideration of consequences, critical thinking and problem solving, Regulating your emotions, your personality, okay? Basically, everything that makes us human is happening up here, okay? Just as an illustration, because it's kind of gory and fun, there was a guy by the name of Phineas Gage. Anybody heard that name before? Okay, back in the 1800s, he was working on the railroads. There was an explosion and a railroad, like, post spike, okay, flew up, went through his chin, back behind his face, and came out in his frontal lobes. Yeah, that kind of sucks, huh? He lived through that. <laughs> they were able to get it out. Um, but he was like the nicest guy before and an absolute jerk afterwards. Because that damage to those frontal lobes, and specifically way up front what we call the prefrontal cortex, had made it so he couldn't regulate his emotions. He didn't have any inhibitions, so like he couldn't figure out, oh, you know what, I probably shouldn't say that to somebody. That's kind of rude, right? <laughs> so he would just say whatever he wanted to say. He'd have fits of temper, you know, he was kind of violent. So he went from being this great, nice guy to just being really kind of nobody wanted to be around him because of damage to that area, okay? All right, now why is this important to know what the different parts of the brain do? I've got a little animation that we're going to show you that's going to kind of illustrate for you. And this is the one we have to open separately. 
This is gonna illustrate for you how the brain develops over time. And when we talk about development of the brain, generally what we're talking about is how the neurons start to talk to each other. Okay, can they communicate effectively to each other and to different parts of the brain? And we see that that happens at different times in our lives in different areas of the brain, okay? So even before we start the animation, first of all, a couple of notes. If your brain is turning blue, please call a doctor. And if you can see your brain, please call a doctor. <laughs> Neither of those conditions are good for you, okay? But basically, it's going to turn blue as these areas start to develop. And you can see, even before it starts, that those occipital lobes, no luck, OK. Those occipital lobes are already developed very, very early, right? What were they responsible for? Do you remember way back here? Visual processing, OK? So that makes sense, right? Little kids can process visual input pretty early. Not right at birth, it's kind of all murky at the beginning, <laughs> but pretty early they're able to process what they're seeing, okay? Now some other areas that are, are working pretty early. And it may be in your downloads folder, Ms. Johnson, from last time. These other areas right there, those are those motor cortexes that I was talking about. So the one where we feel things on our body and where we can move our bodies. Okay, so those are developed pretty early as well. We've also got already some activation here. Notice that's the left side of those temporal lobes. So they're already starting to process language and things. There's a very early um, use of language, believe it or not, in young children. All right, now as this brain develops, what you'd see is it turning blue like that, okay? So that development actually happens more or less in a back to front pattern. So if you think about it, that makes sense, doesn't it? Okay, we're gonna develop visual processing, processing of stuff we hear. We start to think about who we are really early, about 18 to 24 months. We realize, oh, I'm not my parents. I'm something different. That's pretty cool, okay? But the frontal lobes are being developed last. Does anybody know at about what age that happens? At about what age do you think those frontal lobes develop? Four? Okay. I was reading a book a few months ago, and they kept saying over and over again, everybody knows that the brain is fully developed by age seven. So we used to think, by that age seven, nope. Okay, let's keep coming up. Okay, about 20 to 25. That's what we've thought now for about 20 years, that that part of the brain was fully developed by about age 20 to 25. Now that starts to make sense if you think about it, right? What's up here? It's all the adult stuff, right? Having to think about the consequences of our actions. Having to plan things in advance. Having to regulate our emotions and kind of filter what we're gonna say to people. Responding to social cues, all that, right? Is up here. So that means that your brains, for the most part, are not all the way developed yet, okay? So when I look at an adolescent, I'm not gonna expect you to be perfect at planning things out. And I'm not gonna necessarily expect you every time to step back and say, hmm, if I engage in this behavior, what will the consequences of my actions be? Same with emotional regulation. Why is it so hard to regulate emotions sometimes? Well, first of all, because hormones are kicking your butt, right? Thanks, puberty, that was nice of you. But also because those parts of the brain that are supposed to help you do that are not fully functional yet, okay? All right, now here's where I, we're starting to get really concerned. So I'd like you all to really focus for the next little bit with me, okay? 20 to 25, that's when we expect your brains to develop. And actually, that's a really good thing. I think on the next slide, I've got a quote about that. Oh, one more down. Oh no, just kidding, okay. That's all right, go back up there. It's really actually a very good thing for you to not be fully developed yet from a brain perspective because without that phase 
of a lack of inhibitions in your minds, we would have no innovation in this country, in this world, right? Lacking inhibitions, having that underdeveloped brain is what allows you to take risks to try new things, to go out and meet new people, all the stuff you're supposed to be doing at this point in your life. That's what lets you do it and be a little braver than us boring adults who like are like, oh, I don't want to try that, that sounds scary, right? You guys are much more brave. That's where a lot of our innovations have come from. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates were young kids when they started coming up with their ideas, right? Most of the ideas that have really pushed us forward have come from underdeveloped brains. So we love them. They're awesome. We want them to be that way. The problem, as you're looking at this slide, is that our most recent research is telling us that the age is changing. So we thought it was 20 to 25. That's when your brain was fully developed. But now, in your generation, I'm speaking specifically about you guys in this room right now, we're seeing a shift of up to 10 years of delay in development. So instead of having a fully developed adult brain by 20 to 25, it's 25 to 35. Okay, That's concerning. Some of it's because our science is a little better and we understand how things work now a little bit better, but most of it is not. So something's happening in our culture, in our society, whatever, that's actually causing these parts of your brain to delay their development. That's happening slower, and that's something that we're worried about, okay? So what we need to talk about now is why. Why do you think you may be experiencing delays in these lobes compared to your parents when they were your age? I have really good wait time, so I'll wait until you come up with some answers. Okay, what about your lifestyle? Okay, so definitely we have more access to electronics, right? Could that play a role? Okay, that could. What else though? Can you think of anything else? Please. I would say that the, it's easier to access information now. Good. Good. I mean, I, I know we as adults say stuff like that all the time, right? Well, in my day, we had to, <laughs> right? But it was, it was a process to find information, right? We had to know how to search for things, how to look for things. And that's not necessarily true anymore. Google, go, right? I, I saw a hand. Uh, yeah. I think Good. Definitely. Okay, so how might drugs be impacting? There are all these things. And so what we're going to talk about for a little bit um, is some of the things that we know go along with these changes, right? If everything you experience in your life physically changes your brain, then that means the things that you choose to do every day are altering your brain, okay? Including the rate at which it develops. You actually have control over how fast these lobes develop. That's a lot of power that we don't often realize that we have. You have power over your brain's development and function. It all depends on what you choose to do. So as we look at the last 20 years and what's changed since just before you guys were born, there are a lot of things that have changed in our culture really, really fast. So we need to talk about some of those. And while we do, what I'd like you to do is think about whether there might be some choices that you could start making that would help you a little bit. I'm not saying like, you need to fix your brains, weirdos, or anything like that. What I'm saying is being a teenager is hard enough without having delays in the areas that are supposed to help make it easier, right? So if you can be doing things that can actually start to get these lobes working in your head, you can make your life easier and better on a daily basis. Direct impact, okay? So let's start going through some of these. And we will actually start with the immediacy of information. Okay? If you don't have to think about things, then we're not using the part of our brains that are responsible for critical thinking. Right? 
for complex thinking. I'm not saying to get rid of your tech. I'm not saying to go throw out your smartphone right now. But what I am saying is we need to be a little bit careful about how quick we are to rely on it for answers to things, rather than to stop and think about it for a bit first. Okay. That's number one. Obviously, information is much easier to get now than it was before. We're going to talk about some other aspects of technology, too, though. Okay? TV has been around a lot longer than 20 years. I'm aware of that. But today, on average, you guys are still spending about four hours a day, four and a half, watching TV. Now, I know that TV itself is changing, right? It's not always TV, it's Netflix, it's Hulu, it's Amazon Prime, it's YouTube, and it's Vines, right? I know kids that'll spend, on average, six to eight hours a day watching Vines, right? The problem with television, or sitting and watching YouTube videos, or whatever it may be, is that your brain is really passive when you're doing that, right? This is what I look like when I watch TV. I look like that. Okay, I'm not like, oh, at any time when I'm watching television, okay? So literally, those frontal lobes will shut off, and you just kind of absorb what's happening on television. For the most part, there's educational programming that's a little bit better, or interesting programming, like if you watched Cosmos this weekend, it was awesome, right? <laughs> but for the most part, we just kind of shut off when we're watching these things. If you're shutting this off, it's not developing. Those connections are not being made in this part of the brain, okay? So be careful about the types of things you're doing with your tech. Quite frankly, I would rather you play two hours of video games than watch two hours of television. Because for the most part, video games are requiring problem solving and critical thinking and interaction and all kinds of stuff, whereas television is really passive, okay? All right, coming down. How many of you look like this when you're doing your homework? <laughs> no, never. Okay. This is actually the one that scares me the most. Okay. For a lot of different reasons. So we need to stop and talk about this one pretty sincerely for a few minutes. First of all, our brains can't multitask. It's impossible. You know how I showed you those little guys that are your working memory? That's how big they are. <laughs> They're tiny. So our brains actually are not capable of focusing on anything more than one complex task at a time. We can't do it. So what happens is as you try to focus on homework and the texts that are coming in and make sure you're responding appropriately and quickly to Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and all of this stuff at the same time, right? then your brain starts to try to fragment your attention. And what you end up with, instead of any level of focused attention, you get this really surface level attention. So you're not making strong connections. You're not learning in depth. You're not focusing in depth, which means we're not using our critical thinking skills. As you're reading your textbook, for example, you're not stopping to reflect on what that might mean or if you've seen that before or making any connections, right? It's just really surface level. So that's directly impairing your memory as well as your thought processes and the types of skills that you're developing. Can a, an adult brain no. no. No, in fact, we're worse at it. <laughs> so because they've grown up doing it, you guys have grown up in this environment. That's the difference, right? We've adapted to it. You guys have grown up in it. Your brains are actually a little bit better at this. Like, when I try to do this, I end up te texting my colleagues, hey, honey, what do you want for dinner? It's really awkward, right? You guys are a lot better. It's, and, and it's what we call task switching. So you're better at switching between those tasks quickly and without making mistakes. That doesn't mean you're not at a surface level, right? You're still at that surface level, not learning very effectively. That's not good, but now we're going to get into what's really bad about this. Okay. When we try to multitask, our body, because our brain is not adapted to do that, our bodies and our brains start to release stress hormones like cortisol. Okay. 
Now, when that happens occasionally, we all get busy sometimes, right? And you feel that like, I've got so much to do, right? When that happens occasionally and a little bit of cortisol gets released out into our brain, it actually can help us focus and help us get stuff done. But when it's happening all the time, then that cortisol actually starts to eat away at your hippocampi, those little guys that are supposed to help you have working memory. Okay? It actually starts to eat the cells in there. So you start losing the ability to remember things. And cortisol is not a very good neurotransmitter. It's not good at carrying messages around in your brain. So it's also impacting your ability to think. Okay? But what that also does is it puts you in a constant state of anxiety. So as I look at you and your lives and what you go through on a daily basis, and it's so much different from how I grew up, and I'm not that much older than you, okay? I didn't have my parents texting me in the middle of class. And I didn't have friends texting me. And I didn't have that pressure to respond on social media that you guys have appropriately and quickly. I didn't have as many expectations on me as you guys have, okay? I was born, luckily, just before, actually, I just had mean parents, I think is what it is. Um, <laughs> but there was this great movement called the self-esteem movement where we figured we'd just tell you that you're smart and awesome all the time. And then that would make you smart and awesome and happy. Well, the result has really been that because we've been telling you you're smart and awesome from birth, then any time something's difficult for you, we haven't given you the tools to deal with it very effectively. Right? Well, this is difficult for me, but I was told I'm smart, so something's not right. Rather than focusing on, okay, when we have challenges, what do we do? Okay. So you're walking around in what we call a state of continuous partial attention which means that you have so many things on your plate and so much pressure on you that your brain is constantly trying to multitask, trying to deal with all of these issues at the same time, trying to make sure you feel good, trying to respond to everything, which puts that cortisol in your brain all the time. And as a result, we have higher levels of anxiety and depression in your generation than we have ever seen before, ever. There are some estimates, we look at it five times higher than during the Great Depression. Everybody was supposed to be depressed then. It sucked, right? Your generation is having a harder time. And we think a lot of it is this, just this intense pressure, right? When we look at Facebook, why is this slide up here? We have the data on Facebook. We don't have it on Instagram and Snapchat yet because those are newer, right? Facebook's for old people, I know, okay? But we have sufficient evidence now that tells us that the more time you spend on Facebook, the sadder and more anxious you become. Why would that be? What kinds of things do people post on social media? I'm sure you guys right now are getting on Facebook and being like, sitting in a lecture. Right. And you're not, that's not what you're posting. And, but that's your life, right? What, what we tend to post on social media, and I do it too, right? We post the worst things that are happening to us, and we post the best things that are happening to us. And when we as human beings see what our friends are going through, the worst things, right? We look at that, and we naturally feel compassion for them. That's not a bad thing but it can bring us down, right? And when we look at their best things that are happening to them, naturally, as human beings, we compare ourselves with them. Well, they got that invited to that party, and I didn't. Their dress looks better. They look way better in that picture than I would, right? We do all this comparison. So we spend all of our time in social media, or the vast majority of it, either feeling badly for others or feeling badly for ourselves. Okay. So between the fractured attention and that phenomena that we see happening on social media, again, these really high rates of anxiety and depression. And if this is what we're constantly doing with our mind, then those are the pathways that we're setting up, making it harder and harder for us to deal with some of these issues that are facing us daily. 
And again, please remember that every person's experience is different. So if your parents raised you one way or you had some experiences in your life so that you're a little bit more prepared to face some of this pressure and your friend may not be, then that friend may be struggling a whole heck of a lot more than you are with that. Okay? All right, so again, I'm not telling you to get off social media. I'm not telling you to throw your devices away. What I'm asking you to do is to please think about your use. How are you balancing it? What are you balancing it with? Okay. Do you take some time off from your devices? How do you feel when you get texts? I can actually watch you guys as your phones buzz in your pockets and you're not allowed to get them and like you twitch a little bit. <laughs> and your anxiety goes up and up and up and up, right? We can actually see it. So it's concern. It's like <coughs> sincere appreciation for you as human beings that's bringing me here today to talk to you about this and just say think about how you're using it, okay? There are some other things I do want to talk about. It's not just tech that's going along with this problem. So nutrition. We've got some major issues in this country. And I'm not talking about the obesity epidemic. That one's an obvious one. We know there's a problem there. What I'm going to talk about for just a minute is your nutrition as teenagers and how that impacts your brain and how it works. Okay? Biggest problem we have among teenage diets is sugar. How much sugar have you already had today? <laughs> Look at your food labels. You'd be shocked by how much food is, or how much sugar is in everything you eat, okay? So the problem with sugar is that it doesn't make your behavior hyper necessarily. It actually goes up into your brain and it makes your neurons hyper. So your brain cells are literally going like, eh, okay? And that's not a good state for learning. Things don't learn when they're going, eh, that just doesn't work, okay? And it burns off the sugar really fast because they're in this hyper state, right? And then it drops them way down into a depressive state. So then all your neurons are just like, dude. And by eating a lot of sugar in your diet, what you're doing is cycling between these two states in your brain, neither of which are at all good for learning or memory or development. So watch your sugar intake really carefully. The other thing I want to talk to you about with regard to nutrition is fat. We've been living in a very fat-focused culture for about the last 20 years, with a lot of no-fat and low-fat diets being emphasized. The problem with that is, what is that myelin made out of, that protective covering? Yeah, it's made out of fat. So if you're not eating fat in your diet, you're not creating the insulation for your axons in your brain meaning that when you try to think, it's just leaking out everywhere, right? Please. Frequently, no-fat options or low-fat options have more sugar. They do. Well, yeah, so they go hand in hand here, <laughs> okay? So we've got to be so careful about these two things. Watch how much sugar is in your diet. Make sure you're getting fat. And I know you guys don't have full control over what you eat because your parents buy a lot of it and make a lot of it for you. But you can go home and say, hey, mom, please stop buying Pop-Tarts for breakfast. Okay? And you can ask if you can have salmon once or twice this week. And actually, having healthy fats as part of your diet is also directly linked to states of depression. People who don't get enough fat in their diet have higher rates of depression. Help your brain out a little bit so that you're not forcing yourself into these anxious states. Okay? Do whatever you can. All right. Now, you brought it up, so we're going to talk about it for a bit. Drugs and alcohol, what's going on? This slide does not show drugs killing brain cells, because that's not actually what happens. What I'm showing you here, these are the neural connections in an infant's brain. There are not very many, because they don't have any experiences, right? You don't get connections until you have experiences. This is a six or seven year old's brain. Makes sense, right? If you look at four-year-olds, they're like, oh, that's new. That's cool. Let me see that. So they're always like making connections and learning stuff. But that's nasty. Like, I would not want to walk around with a four-year-old's brain all day, every day. <laughs> like, not very efficient, right? So 
between like six or seven and about age 12, we start to clean up. It's called pruning. So our brain goes through and says, OK, I don't need that. These things are all the same. Let's group these together. And it just kind of cleans things up generally so that we can think more effectively. In adolescence, so between 12 and about 17, 18, we cycle back to here. Okay, So you already have hormones. You've got underdeveloped frontal lobes. And then let's just throw a whole bunch of new brain cells in there just for kicks. That's what's going on in your brains right now. Nice, huh? Okay, so if you've got all these brand new brain cells, they're basically like little sponges saying, hey, teach me, teach me, tell me what to do, show me stuff, right? So here's the problem. If we throw drugs and alcohol into that system with all these brand new brain cells screaming out to be trained, they actually learn that the drug or the alcohol is supposed to help them think. They try to use it as a neurotransmitter. Marijuana is not the best neurotransmitter, right? People are not generally like, I'm going to smoke marijuana, and then I'm going to think about things really hard. That's not what happens. Okay, It's not a good one. No drugs or alcohol are really good neurotransmitters. They try to pretend, but they're not. But your brain learns, oh, I'm supposed to try to use this substance to think. And the reason why that's so scary is because then when our brain tries to produce the real neurotransmitters, things like dopamine that are awesome for thinking, your brain has no idea what to do with it. So all these new brain cells are just going, what's that? And they're missing out on this thinking opportunity. This has lasting effects. People that abuse drugs in their teenage years, between 12 and 18 years of age especially, okay. 20, 30 years later, we're still seeing memory impairment and thinking impairment. It's a lasting impact. It's not just, OK, once the drug wears off, I'm good to go. Because you've trained your brain cells that they're supposed to try to work with this chemical. Okay, So it's huge at your age to avoid this. Tell your friends. Just say no. OK. All right, now as we keep going down, I want to talk to you about a few other important things that you can be doing for yourselves. Okay, So sleep is a major issue. How many hours of sleep do you get on average, do you think? You're awesome. Eight, five, six. That's usually what I hear. Okay? Most adolescents get around, yeah, about the six hours of sleep range. Okay. That's not entirely your fault. We realize in the education system we are messing with you people. Okay, Let me explain what's going on with your sleep. Little kids, the chemical that's supposed to help them fall asleep gets released at about 7 or 8 o'clock at night, which is why your siblings, like your little brothers and sisters, get like extra annoying right then. Okay, Yours doesn't release. Okay, Once you hit, hit about puberty, usually around 14 or 15 is when this change happens, that chemical doesn't release until about 10 or 11 sometimes even 12. So you may have noticed that as you became a teenager, you didn't get tired until later. Okay. Now, how much, of sleep, how much sleep do you guys actually need? Adults need eight, because their brains are all done developing. So they need about seven or eight. You guys still need nine or 10 hours of sleep a night for full brain function. You need nine or 10 hours of sleep. That never happens. I know. Okay. So if you think about it, your brain's not releasing this chemical that tells you to go to sleep until 11. Let's like err on the low side and say you need nine hours of sleep. When should you be getting up? Eight. You should be getting up at eight, which means that your sleep cycle is at its lowest point. And during that lowest point, that's when our brain goes through and it cleans things up and it consolidates and it like rewinds and replays memories over and over again to make them stronger. It does all this really important stuff right when you're getting up to go to school, 6, 7 o'clock in the morning. That's when it's supposed to be doing all that stuff for you. So we know we have a problem in education. We're looking at that. Okay. 
But there are some things you can do. You can actually train your brain to go to bed a little bit earlier, and you can work on the quality of your sleep. Okay? So we can train our brains to go asleep, to sleep a little bit earlier by doing some of those basic, it's called sleep hygiene things, like turning down the lights a little bit. Kind of set a target for a half an hour or so before bed where we put screens away. That's a hard one, I know. But put screens away. There's something about the flicker rate and the lights on the screens that we use that actually activates and hyper excites our neurons, especially at night. Okay. So if you can put those screens away half an hour before bed, keep your phone out of your room, guys. You see him sleeping with his phone. I know a lot of you use your phones as your alarm clocks. But the problem is every time a text comes in and you hear that buzz, that's waking you up, your anxiety is increasing, right? You're not going to get quality sleep that way. So if we can turn down lights, put devices away, keep them out of your room, half hour before bed, that's going to help you fall asleep faster and get better sleep throughout the night. Those are easy things that you guys can do. All right. Do I have more? Okay. Please make sure that you're challenging yourselves. These parts of the brain, the ones that we're worried about, are all about challenge. Okay. I'm not saying that you have to like go out and take AP calculus tomorrow. <laughs> Oh, that's fun, right? Um, but what I am saying is if you are taking all the easy classes, knock that off and take something that's challenging. And it doesn't just have to be at school, right? I'm a runner. I run every day. My challenges sometimes are, you know what, I'm going to run an extra mile or two today, and I'm going to push myself and make myself do it. And these parts of my brain get involved in that thing. You can do it. Keep going, right? So you've got to make sure there's challenge in your life. Now, I want you, especially as teenagers, to balance that, please, with periods where you're not challenging yourself, where you're kind of being quiet and reflecting. If, if we move on a little bit, um, you tend to be really hard on yourselves. Okay? So you've got all this challenge, you've got lots of pressure, and then you tend to be really hard on yourselves as well. If you're telling yourself things like this all the time, you're actually building pathways in your head that believe that and start to dictate to you what you should choose to do, what you think you're good at. So you've got to be careful about what you're saying to yourself. I put this one up here. I just want to emphasize why I put this one here. Two reasons. One, the word just up there makes me laugh. Being a mom is the hardest thing I have ever done in my life. It uses my frontal lobes all the time. <laughs> like, it's intense. There's, so there's no such thing as just being a parent. And I could say dad up there too. That's fine. The other reason I put this up there, though, is that a lot of women in this state are saying that. I just want to be a mom, so I'm not going to worry about doing well in high school or going on to college or anything. So they're not putting forth that cognitive effort and working on these areas of their brain. And Utah actually has the lowest rate in the entire country of women going to college and graduating from college. We are the worst in the country. And that's not acceptable. There are an awful lot of parents in this state. And they're not educated. Not to the level they could be. So pushing ourselves to get that is important. Now, as we come down, two more things I want you to be doing for yourself every single day if you want your brain to function more effectively, and especially if you want to decrease your stress and your anxiety levels. OK? I love this comic. It makes me laugh. We still have, even though we have all this evolution and your brains are different from your parents' brains, okay? We still have kind of caveman brains. They're wired just like our caveman ones, really. So we're programmed to be outside, but we're not getting outside. And that's actually increasing our anxiety and depression levels, okay? So if you can spend a half an hour outside every day, and that can just be sitting on your back porch. I don't care where it is. But getting outside for a half an hour every day, it actually brings down your stress levels, can give you a time to kind of reflect and let things go for a little bit. If we pair that with the next one, OK, we've got a problem here as well. Pair your being outside with getting some exercise, OK? Exercise releases really good neurotransmitters like endorphins that help us to think more clearly. But it also does some other really cool stuff. It brings down our anxiety levels. It decreases the amount of that cortisol, that stress hormone. 
But it also, when you go out and exercise, and again, I'm a runner. We found a lot, like running is the best, but do anything you want. Do yoga, do Zumba, I don't care. But when you exercise, you create little tears in your muscles. And there are chemicals that go in there and fix up those tears. That's what makes you stronger. The same chemicals go up into your hippocampi, those areas of your brain that make memory and serve as your working memory, and create brand new brain cells. So that damage we've done to those through all of the stress can actually be undone through the exercise. All right? So I presented you with a lot of information today. What I'm hoping that you'll do is walk away thinking about how you can balance your technology use a little better, how you can work on that multitasking and try to reduce that because it's really causing problems for you. Think about your food, think about your sleep, think about your exercise, okay? Thank you guys, appreciate it.